Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Paul Brown Show. This evening, I have retired detective, but coming back, Gary McFadden from Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department Homicide Unit. How you doing there? I'm doing fine. Great. Doing fine, Mr. Brown. Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Well, I retired from um, Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department um, July 31st, 2011, after 29 years of service with the uh, Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. I left um, as a homicide detective after being there for 20 years. And um, September 1st, they hired me back to come and work the DNC. Awesome, awesome. What do you like most about being a homicide detective? I just love the people, uh, meeting the people, meeting the families. Uh, to me, it was much more after the homicide because you get to know the family, you get to know the victims, and um, you get to know what life was really like for the victim and what happened up until the homicide. And I think I like that part of it. And then dealing with the family. That was my, my true love, dealing with the families. One big issue we have in our community is our youth and homicide. Why is that becoming a big issue? Well, I think our youth today look at us like we don't care about them. We look at them like we don't care about you. Because uh, in talking to youth, which I do just about every week, sometime every day, you know, I sit down or go where they are and have true conversation with them. No cameras, no media, you know, no hoopla, just what's going on in your life. And then it's consistent. I found out if you be more consistent in being in their lives, you will find out more, peel back the layers, and they'll open up to you. Okay, you said more into their lives. What do you mean by that? Well, I had, I talked to an individual that I had sent to prison uh, for committing murder, uh, two counts of murder. And he was 17 years old when he committed the murder, and he's now 21 years old in prison. And uh, I talked to him a couple of times since he's been in prison, and he said something that really just, you know, touched me. He says, when we were talking about why he did the murder and what happened in his life, he says that the negative in the community was more consistent than the positive. And I asked him to explain that to me. And we just talked about it. And that's something I always remember him talking about because he said, you know, out of all the mentoring groups and all the people who come and believe that they are really helping, they only help him for four hours once a month or once a weekend, four hours. And he said, they take us out. They take us to the basketball game to get us tickets to the Panthers game. We go to play golf. We learn tennis and all. And we always go eat pizza. And then they drop us right back into the problems that we've had. But where are they when we want to talk to them at 2 o'clock in the morning? Or are they really keeping up with me prior to that, that weekend they're going to be with me? Why not call me on a Tuesday and say, what's going on? Let me just pick you up and let's talk to you. So then when they feel like nobody really cares, they have a, a sense of not caring for themselves too. So it's another means of being consistent as far as, you know, letting the child know that you're not just concerned during a certain time frame like on just like you said, Saturdays or weekends, but at all times. Right. I mean, I believe if you take the kids, not kids, young men phone numbers, mm -hmm. when you're talking to them, you just can periodically call them. You know, when I call the guys going back to school this year, I said, okay, first day of school, man. You know, is everything going to be all right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. After that first day of school, call back. How was, it, how was it? You know, who's in school? Nothing has to be structured, just, just general conversation. Me and four young men went out to, to lunch one day just after they got an award that, 90% of the parents weren't there to see them receive their award. And that was heartbreaking to me. Yeah. So three or four of us just went out to lunch and it was the best time we had that day. And I mean, for them, they still call and all they want to do is to go out to have lunch again with me. And that's it. I noticed that a lot of our youth, especially the young men, they just want, just like you said, they want some communication. They want, they have a lot to talk about. Right. You know, one young man didn't come to a meeting one night and I asked him uh, why you didn't come up to the meeting that morning. And he said, can I talk to you later? And I said, yeah. And he says, you know, last night the police raided our house looking for my brother. And so his morning, you know, when he came, comes to school, they were saying, why are you late for school and why are you not on time? And when he was trying to explain it to him, they said, just go to class. That was his morning, not knowing that he just came out of a situation where he was dealing with the police, he was placed on the floor by the officers uh, to, to secure the house, and they're looking for his brother. They get him off the floor, he brushes himself off, and he walks to school. Nobody knows what he went through 
20 minutes prior to arriving to school. So if you're getting to it and talk with these kids and stuff and find out what really their lives are like, I think you'll find out more about them and we can reach them better. But be consistent. Correct. How is it so that our youth can go to school? Do you think that's a big issue as far as them coming to school after dealing with situation like the young man yeah. do and be able to really function in our school system? And that is what the kids or the young people say. Well, if there's a shooting in the neighborhood or a school classmate is killed overnight, Charlotte Mecklenburg is going to send counselors to the school, okay, because they heard about somebody getting shot. The kid said, that really doesn't affect me if I don't know the person. Mm -hmm. You know, they can come and bring the counselors, but here's something directly affects me because I was placed on the floor, I was handcuffed, you know, I had to sit in the in a police car and wait for somebody to ID me, ID me not as my brother, but then I arrived at school with that same crisis and nobody's there for me. Mm -hmm. Another kid who was 12 years old when we talk, he's 19 now, he said his first murder he saw, he was 12 years old. His friend got killed in front of him. He got counseling maybe for a week. No, he didn't get counseling at all because it happened in the neighborhood. So he goes to school, nobody talks to him. Nobody knows that his friend has just been killed. He told them, but then he goes on through life and he's seen at least, he says, nine, other, nine to 10 other friends been killed. So do somebody come and counsel him? Somebody's periodically checking on him? Not really. And these are the people who we want to function properly in society and our schools. So how do we solve that problem? Because it, it learns that it seems like a lot of the issues is coming from outside the classroom, but they're bringing it in, you know, and they're not being able to focus. Well, I think we have to first be committed to the real cause, not just the kid said, not just come and talk to me one or two days, you know, kind of be there for me a little bit more. Just general conversation, look into what, what I'm going through. You know, we have a lot of time on our hands, whether we believe it or not. We'll go to charity events, we'll go to dinners, we'll go golfing, we'll go fishing. We can just on talking on the cell phone while you have some downtime. If you're at the airport waiting for a flight and you got a two hour delay, you could pick up that phone and easily call one of those kids and just have a conversation. Hey. I'm, I'm, I'm going for Atlanta today, man. You know, just going to Atlanta to take care of some business. You could be all right. So I get back, just a general joking conversation. Or he said, I'm going to call you when I land. Just that conversation with that young man, I found for me, really helps. When you investigate a lot of these homicide scenes, do you, do you feel like there's a lot of people that know each other? Oh, yes. With these? Most of the time, if, if the homicide happens in the neighborhood, they know the victim and they know the suspect. Now, whether they tell us about the suspect, that's gonna be up to the code of the community and the neighborhood. And you know, they call it not snitching uh, or snitching. That is something that each neighborhood has to deal with on itself. Uh, but we find out that the, the whole neighborhoods do know each other most of the time. And so they know the suspect and they know the victim. How in our community are we able to deal with I know we talk about the snitching, uh, but when it happens to us personally, we don't consider it to be snitching. We have a whole different idea of someone telling. When but, it comes see, that's what I think it takes us to go in the community and educate the community what you believe snitching is. When the drug dealers on the corner, I tell them, I put it to them as this. If me and you are standing on the corner selling drugs and the officer sees us and they jump out and chase us, and they only catch me, then I would consider if I tell them, well, that's Mr. Brown was with me, I would consider that snitching. They consider that snitching. But I don't even consider it really, really snitching. It's that um, this is what the community has said, this is snitching. But when somebody's killed in the neighborhood, there's a killer in the neighborhood. They have killed somebody in your neighborhood. So you're not going to tell us and let a killer remain in the neighborhood, I don't, I can't understand that. I never understand that because that person has killed somebody. That person may kill somebody you love or may even kill you. So you're going to just let that person run rampant in the neighborhood? No. I think that's when you need to educate the community. We cannot have this type of activities in our community. 
Looking back from the time you started off as a homicide detective, what do you see as the difference between back when you first started and today? Um, community. Community. There's no sense of community anymore. Uh, you can go to the neighborhoods and it's not a neighborhood community group of people. The communities are there and then, but you don't have that lady who's sitting in the window who can yell to you and tell you to stop doing something and then you respect her, Mrs. Brown, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry about that. You don't have that anymore. Uh, even down to the police officers. When I first, I loved the West Side. I, all my patrol days was on West Boulevard and I still love West Boulevard and that west side of town. It's just something that and Beatty's Ford Road, who people consider are high crime areas. I love those areas uh, because there was real people there. There are still good real people, yeah. but then the community changes with the officers. There's no respect for the officers, you know, and that's, that's a big issue to me. No respect for the people in your community and no respect for the officers. That has changed drastically, drastically. In my opinion, I think there's also a lack of respect for our elders. Very much. You know, it's a whole different, the communication that the kids, the younger kids do to the elders is. But I think that, that, that goes back to how we teach our kids and what we teach our kids. You know, we said it starts at home. It certainly does start at home. Then can the school get a little bit of the blame? Yes, the school can get some of the blame too. Does the churches get some of the blame? Yes, the churches get some of the blame too. But then we're going to have, we can, a person that can accept an award for good in the community, but they will not accept the bad for what's going on in the community. And one kid said this. He says, Mr. McFadden, how can these people accept community awards for our community and the bad things are still happening in our community? How can they stand there and just take an award and say they revitalized the community and my brother's killed? Or we've never seen this guy in the community. And, and those kind of things are embedded into these young people's hearts. And if we reach them and let them talk to us, I think we need to go back. We have every panel a discussion. When we go to these discussions, it's our community leaders or who we believe our community leaders at the head table speaking to the kids. If we reverse that and let the kids talk to us, we will learn a lot. We will learn a great deal from them. I know we had like numerous homicides within the Greer Heights community and it was like how, how did that affect that community, in your opinion? Well, it, it affected a lot because Greer Heights, as known to some people as Greer Town, and they changed it to Greer Heights, is an old community in Charlotte. It has a lot of rich history, and there are wonderful people still living in that community, but they still have the small problems rooted in the community. And I think that the marches and everything were great, and it was a great beginning, but it has to be consistent. You can't have a march one day and then not have a follow-up, town hall meetings, community activists on the corner, you know, continuously, continuously, you know, pouring into that community before we can turn it around. It's great people over there. They had their share of problems, but I think if the community and the city leaders get behind them, you know, we can resolve a lot of their problems over there. As far as the community leaders, are they, are you feel, do you feel that they're doing the best that they can for these certain areas? No. And you can tell them I said it, no. Why you say that? Because, I, you know, I think that you have to be consistent in these people's lives in order for them to trust you. You know, yes, when the cameras are there, we're shaking hands. Yes, when the cameras are there, you know, when they're uh, sleeping out, we are there. But are you there when no cameras are there? Correct. Are you going to the communities or calling people and having your own rallies and just saying, what else can we do for you? You know, not just doing the political uh, process or not doing the political time of the year, I think that we could do much more and get more involved. That's just my feelings about it. I know we have a lot of like city council meetings, county commissioner meeting, board of education meeting. Why is it so important that we get involved and get educated in these type of meetings and attend them? Because they are talking about your community and if you don't get involved, they will make decisions for your community and that's what I think we have to understand when when you have a, a commit you have a kind of commission you have a, um, a city councilman you should talk to them and tell them what's going on in your community and that person represents you so then but you also should attend a meeting